Two Borg cubes fly towards the screen and threaten us a bit. Then they get pooped on and kaboom, so that's the end of the threat this episode, and we'll have a solid 45 minutes of everybody just relaxing. As if to prove this, Janeway is on the holodeck, talking to Gimli from Lord of the Rings, or Professor Arturo from Sliders, depending on how old you are. This time he's Leonardo da Vinci, and Janeway wants permission to use a corner of his workshop for her own artistic endeavours, so she can be around him. Tangentially, a point to the writers here for him working on a mechanical man in a Borg episode. Janeway's fun is cut short by a call from Chicote, who says we have a problem. To engineering, where we're told a probe we sent out two months ago to scan ahead has picked up some unpleasant data. I guess we could have a conversation about how a probe is faster than the fastest ship in Starfleet, but let's not spoil the moment. Meeting time, and we learn that we're coming up to Borg space. There's rather a lot of it, and going round would be a right pain in the balls. Good news then that there's a narrow corridor in the middle that we can fly down, and if this sounds familiar, it's because we've heard it before. In fact, we've lifted this plot point in its entirety from the season 2 finale, where we flew down a narrow corridor in the middle of Kazon space. We even copy the bit where each department tells us they've made significant preparations. Still, what are the chances of this going terribly, just because it did the last time, right? Anyway, the corridor has gravimetric wibbly something in, so that's why the Borg avoid it. Voyager's probably a bit more nimble than a giant D6, so we think we can give it a go. Action time, and everybody looks terribly busy. Chuckles is pointing at a screen, Janeway's looking at some guns, and the boxy thing is being rolled down a corridor. We're even giving our collection of Game Boy cartridges a good clean, in case the Borg want to borrow our copy of Pokemon Blue. In sick bay, the Doc is trying to science a way of stopping the Borg from taking over a host, perhaps an immune response of some kind to fight off the mini-bots. Kess seems rather more interested in the Borg bits we've dissected, and her psychic shenanigans make a reappearance in the form of a vision. Either something's messed up the Borg good and proper, or Damien Hurst's been up to his shit again. We'll go with option one and assume it's the same something that kaboomed those two cubes at the opening of the show. We learn from Tuvok that Kez's visions have continued and, as well as dead Borg, she also saw the destruction of Voyager. Janeway decides not to turn around, but it would have been academic anyway as we detect Borg ships straight afterwards. Some sort of wibbly slows us down and they catch up to us. One of the cubes poops a green line at us, but it's just a scan and they scarper after, apparently, not finding anything of interest. Looks like they've got somewhere else to be, or, perhaps, a good reason to not be here. A little later, Janeway's going over the logs of captains who've been in contact with the Borg. Chakotay joins her, and after a chat about that, the conversation turns to accepting the possibility that they may not be able to get back home and making a decision to settle here. I'd have liked a greater exploration of that, but Tuvok interrupts and calls Janeway to the bridge. We found those cubes that passed us a while back. Well, bits of them anyway. We don't know what kicked the shit out of them, but whatever it was, it's something we've never met before, according to data about the weapons used. Whilst we don't detect any ships in the area, there are some biological signals detected on the debris. We zoom in to discover it's the Vorlons from Babylon 5. We try to give it a call with no success, and teleporting or tractoring it doesn't work either. Janeway's curiosity is engaged now, so she's sending an away team to the fragment of cube that biological bobbins is attached to. Tuvok is intrigued by this tactical choice as there are still Borg drones aboard, but we're going anyway. To the cube, where they seem to be having one or two problems. Tuvok's clearly done his reading and tells Chicote and Kim to lower their weapons, as Borg won't prioritise them unless they're a threat. A little more poking about, and Kim calls the other two over. He's discovered the art installation that Kez had visions about, but we're not here for sightseeing, and Chicote moves them all along. They find a fleshy corridor, apparently from that biological thing attached to the hull, suggesting it's a ship, and scans of warp wibblies from inside it seem to confirm this. There's also a Borg trying to probe it and having the same lack of success that we had earlier with teleporting it. Whatever it is, it doesn't much care about manufactured technology. Leaving Kim to try and access the Borg's computer, Chicote and Tuvok walk down the meat corridor to take a look and find biological analogues of Starship components. They also find one of the Borg drones, and he doesn't look too healthy based on the fungus over his face. Some noises on the Borg ship bother Kim, and while he scans around a bit, Kez has a vision of shit going real bad for him, and the Doc tells Janeway about it. 
That's enough to convince her that they should come back. The teleporter has other ideas, though, as whatever made that noise is also making a bioelectric wibbly that interferes with things. Not to worry, though, as Bellana just comes up with a whole new way of locking onto people for teleport by pulling an idea straight out of her ass. Just as well as the pilot of our mystery meat ship has turned up and twats Kim. He screams a bit and they're teleported away, while our CG friend takes a swipe at the air. Back on the bridge, we see the meat ship power up and Kez has another psychic shenanigan, then falls over a bit. Janeway translates this as being bad and decides we should leg it. Meat ship poops a bit of yellow on our shields, but we put our foot down and speed off. Kez recovers enough to nick Chakotay's chair before telling us that she was able to chat with the meat ship pilot. They're telepathic, you see, and their message is, the weak shall perish, which is far from encouraging. Kim's having a bad time of things. The same shrooms that were nomming that drone on the meat ship are chewing through him. The doc's given it a poke and discovered it's made of biological matter with very complicated DNA, and the immune response it has can immediately fight off Borg assimilation, which is probably why they're getting stomped. The docs modified some mini-bots from the Borg corpse we grabbed a few episodes back and made them pretend to be the DNA so they can backstab it, but modifying enough to fix Kim will take days. Oh, and he's awake during all this because that same immune response fights off all sedatives. Sucks to be Kim. At least he did something useful before getting spored. Balana's poking around the data he grabbed from that cube and is updating Chakotay and Tuvok. It seems the Borg refer to the meat ship's pilot as species 8472, because why treat a series cliffhanger seriously when you can put in a tiresome number reference and destroy all immersion? As an aside, I cannot stand the 47 bullshit. I'm aware of the history of it, and frankly, that makes it worse, an indulgence bordering on the masturbatory. If you're a writer who's listening to this, you need to understand that saying a number doesn't qualify as a joke, insider or otherwise. I can't believe that's something actual professional writers who do this for a living need explaining to them, but here we are. But again, and for the last time this season, I digress. That same data tells us the Borg have encountered the number species on multiple occasions, and each time got their ass handed to them. Oh, and one more thing, that corridor we're flying down? The Borg aren't staying out of it because of those gravimetric watsits, they're staying out because it's chock full of meat ships which is our cue to find a shed load of them right in our path. They're coming out of a shiny sky thing, and Tuvok uses the word quantum, so we're at level two on the danger table. Kez is picking something up from them, and that something seems to be, we are very evil and have come to kill all the things. That's clear enough for Janeway, who decides to pull a U-turn, then have a chat with Chakotay in her ready room. The way she sees it, they have three choices. One, that narrow corridor where we'd get killed by the number species. Two, outside of that corridor, where we'd get killed by the Borg. Or three, sort of back the way we came and set up a little colony somewhere, like they mentioned earlier. She's not sure which path to take, and Chakotay's no help, so she goes to see Professor Gimli da Vinci instead. He's busy staring at shadows and employing his imagination, and he might as well have stayed that way as, after hearing her problem, his only suggestion is to go and pray. Appealing to God isn't really her thing, but it does give her another idea. Dealing with the devil. Her idea, we discover, is to bargain with the species who've murdered trillions and committed countless genocides. The reception to this is mixed, which is to say some people think it's awful and others think it's terrible. She's the captain, though, so this is the plan. Call the Borg, tell them we've got a weapon to use against the number species, and offer it to them in exchange for safe passage. We'll store the relevant data in the Doctor with a threat to delete him if shit goes bad. This, Janeway believes, will be enough to make them keep their side of the bargain. After everybody else has filed out, Chakotay tells her he thinks this plan is bloody abysmal. A bit of a ding-dong ensues, where Chakotay points out that we're handing a biological weapon to a bunch of robo-bastards, but Janeway's unshakable and refuses to budge. We arrive at a Borg system and a cube pops over to say hi. Janeway tells them about the tech and sends over a taste, causing them to teleport her over to their ship. A bit of back and forth later, and we come to some sort of agreement. Escort us through your space, and we'll work on the weapon together. All of which is interrupted by the arrival of a meat ship fleet, and by their powers combined, they form Captain Planet. Or should that be Captain Planet Cracker, as they use their mega poop to kaboom the Borg world. 
The other cubes are destroyed and the one which snagged Voyager's scarpers was chased by bits of planet, as we're told that the story is to be continued. In this episode we touch on the underlying but often ignored driving purpose for Janeway, that of getting her crew home regardless of the risks that requires. That might be admirable were it not for the fact that it's now taken on a form of compulsion, turning the goal into some sort of holy grail. We've gone from a Janeway who destroyed the array that could have sent them home and refused to trade for a super teleporter because it was against her principles, to one that's willing to facilitate genocide if she believes it's the only way. This is a Janeway who believes getting Voyager back with just three other people left alive would be considered a win, even if they spend the rest of their lives in therapy. It would be a victory so pyrrhic that to even use the name is laughable, and it's born of the sunk cost fallacy mixed with no small amount of egotism. And I confess, I find it fascinating. I've said elsewhere, I think it was in the comments for a video, that the show becoming a vessel for Janeway's increasingly desperate attempts to fulfil a promise she made to herself could give it a far darker but far more interesting perspective. Here we see some of that in action, a Janeway willing to do whatever's necessary for what she believes is best, even as the people she's doing it for tell her she's wrong. The complexity of that juxtaposition is a rich vein worth mining, and I hope we continue with it in the next season. End of episode. Hello, it's Space Dog again. Now, I realise I didn't do a very good job of this end bit last time, so I've come to have another go. I shouldn't have told you to cancel your Patrimonin memberships, because that's your own money and you can waste it however you want. It's a bit weird though, isn't it? Most of these Ubertubers ask for a like or a subscribe or whatever, but this one just goes straight to the money. Not sure I'd trust that myself, but it's your choice. Oh, and I probably shouldn't have called him a bastard either, even if it is technically true because his dad's dead. Woof.